Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Kamanowski, and I teach Bible here at JTS. And um, I'm also going to introduce my, I don't want to say my partner in crime, but my friend and my colleague, Rabbi Louis Warshauer, who's going to also participate in today's session. So I just want to say that when I was thinking about how, you know, the I was part of the planning process for today's conference, and I was thinking what I would like to teach on. Uh, I thought I was going to be much more subversive than, in fact, I actually am. I thought, okay, we're going to be dealing about clothing. I would be dealing with the unclothed body and take a sort of a, a different approach to the material. And I feel like in some ways I still feel it's a little subversive, and I hope uh, it will be fun and exciting together to, to look at this material. But we've already... It, touched on some of the topics that I hope that we will work through a little bit together. Both Valerie Steele mentioned, and even with the head covering, some of the, the issues that I want to raise have already been brought up. So I feel like my material might be uh, a little bit more familiar and less subversive than I initially intended, but we'll see. So <laughs> we'll see what we can do about that. So our theme for this afternoon's session is the unclothed body. And what I would like to do now is just to kind of help frame the conversation by putting forward a number of the assumptions that I'm going to have in today's study session, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what our focus is going to be, and then I'm going to hand the mic over, literally, to, to Lewis, who will take us in uh, a different direction for the first few moments of today's session. So here are my assumptions. My first assumption is that like the clothed body, the naked body is subject to interpretation. The way we see the naked body is subject to interpretation. How one sees the naked body and how the naked body is seen is, number one, culturally dependent. So the way that we see a naked body today in 2012 is very different, right? than the way the naked body was seen in, let's say, my area of expertise, you know, around the year 600 BCE. Very different, okay? So part of that's what we're going to have to work through. So number one, the naked body and how we see it, how it is seen is culturally dependent. Number two, that the way we see the naked body and the way it is seen is tied very much to both sexual, one's sexual and gender orientation. Right? In other words, it matters in terms of how you see the naked body. It matters in terms of your own gender and your own sexual orientation, as well as, frankly, the gender and sexual orientation of the naked body that is being seen. Right? So these are factors that I think are very significant. Now, my particular focus, I am a Bible professor here at JTS, so I'm not going to pretend to be expert on the naked body other than, I don't know if I can pretend to be expert on the naked body in the Bible, but I'm going to do my best. But my focus is, is going to be on the Bible and the questions that I want us to consider together. And I'm going to be very honest. This is very much a work in progress for me. And full disclosure is that this may, in fact, be the next, phase of my own particular research. So whatever we come up with in this room, I actually have, I realize I do actually have some things to say, but I'm really, I really do look at this as a chance for us to kind of work through some of these issues together. So the first general question that I'm going to ask us to think about is how is the naked body perceived in the context of the Bible? Since I just said that it's always, that, that the way we understand or see the naked body is defined by the culture. So my question is, how is the naked body perceived in the context of the Hebrew Bible? And then I want to raise the gender question and ask, is the naked female body perceived differently than the naked male body in the context of the Bible? Okay? Um, and does it function differently? So that's going to be our sort of more of our focus uh, as we go through the text together. But I was trying to, I wanted us to sort of enter into the topic a little bit more generally and a little bit more broadly and think about the ways the naked body has been interpreted in a larger context. So I actually asked uh, Rabbi Warshauer, Lewis, to, to help me do this a little bit. And he's going to get the conversation started by looking at the way the naked body has been presented in some works of art. The, the varieties of the way the naked body is in fact perceived. So I'm going to, and I believe they all focus on Adam and Eve, which is actually going to be one of the first texts that we're going to look at. So this is a good way into the, the particular material that we will also be studying. So I'm going to hand it over now. Lewis. 
Thank you, Amy. And I want to assure everybody that when she said she decided to make things less subversive, that wasn't because of my influence. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that stamping down. Thank you for inviting me. Um, this is a subject that I do a fair amount of teaching on. Uh, most of my teaching, I teach independent study groups, most of my teaching is focused on Bible. And a project I've been working on for a while now is depiction of Bible episodes and characters in works of art, uh, particularly getting at issues of family relationships, and particularly in the book of Genesis, but not only. Uh, as Amy mentioned, we're going to be looking at a little bit of uh, Eve, but I've also added uh, two bonus tracks, <laughs> and that is Bathsheba and Esther. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of different levels here. Uh, there's the level of the Bible itself, and then there's the level of how artists have depicted characters in the Bible. And then the next level is our reaction to the way the artists have depicted those characters. And uh, what I'm looking for in the next couple of minutes is your reactions on seeing these characters and what associations they call to your mind about these characters, specifically with their being, naked, without clothes. So the first slide we're going to see is Adam and Eve. Uh, and as you look at Eve, what, what do you think about Eve? What are your first impressions, given the way she is depicted? The first piece is by... I won't move the lectern, but I'll move my... Oh, oh here we go, so you can see that. Goes was a Flemish artist in the uh, in what's now Belgium in the 1400s. Uh, this is just the beginning of the period that it was okay to depict people without clothes. Uh, however, Adam and Eve are a little bit covered. He's covered by his hand. She is covered by an iris that is strategically growing over there. Uh, her breasts, though, are uncovered. I Iris, by the way, in, the, in this Christian symbolism, because in Christian interpretation, Eve is the forerunner of the Virgin Mary in the following sense, that Eve brought sin into the world. Mary gives birth to Jesus, who redeems the world from sin. Uh, so she, Eve is a, a sinful, a fallen woman, a falling woman, but that she does have the symbol of purity. So what, what do you think of as, as you see her depicted the way she is? Please. Well, I have a question. So just to, before we even start, uh, this is a semantic question as much as it is an aesthetic question. Uh, are we saying naked or nude? Uh, uh, that, that is... Uh, in a sense, an art historical term, and I'll leave it. I'll leave it up to you to use either word. Uh, generally, in in art circles, the word nude is is used because it's a kind of depiction, not simply without clothes, but it's a way of depicting a person. Uh, but I'll I'll leave anyone free to make that choice, and you don't have to be bound by the conventions of any particular <coughs> academic discipline. Please. Well, I carry that. Is there a distinction you're making between unclothed and naked? Again, uh, you tell me. Uh, I'm not going to impose any terms at the moment. I mean, I'm throwing out all these terms and using them freely. You tell me what, what the difference would be. In other words, uh, picking up on what everyone has said, does it make a difference here that Eve, is, whether Eve is unclothed, naked, or nude? Uh, if that leads you to some, I, I urge you not to get stuck in semantics, but if it helps you reach some interesting ideas, please. Yeah. I would take the idea of naked, natural, nature, nature, nature. Nature. So there is nature around. You've got here the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the setting of the Garden of Eden. So one possibility is that the Eve here is Eve in a state of nature. People, everyone, everything that comes into being, of course, comes into being without clothes. Uh, it might have come up before in this conference, but as far as I know, we are the only living species that 
makes clothes for itself. I thought I saw hands somewhere here. What, did, what does this Eve make you, uh, make you think of in terms of her, her state, her condition, be it naked, nude, unclothed, without clothing, natural? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. So uh, one pos she's, uh, she, one of the things I like about this painting is she is looking out at, at the viewer. Uh, she is reaching out her hand to one fruit. The other hand is carrying another fruit. It does have a couple of bite marks in it already. Uh, it's interesting because it says in the book of Genesis that she ate of the fruit and gave some to Adam. It doesn't say whether she gave some of the same fruit or a different one. Uh, so one thing to consider is, is being naked, nude, or unclothed a, um, a form of exhibition? In a society where it is the norm to wear clothes, when you take off your clothes, are you saying, look at me? Yeah? Well, the way that they depict the serpent makes it sort of look as though it's embodied sin, and it creates a contrast that really brings out the nudity because of all the human things. Right? Yeah. It was a convention in uh, European art for uh, quite a while to depict the serpent of Eden with a woman's head. Uh, it was also a convention to depict on the theory that the serpent was, a, a, was Satan, which is found in, in Jewish literature and Midrashim, as well in Christian texts. You got the transition was Satan to dragon. And so here you have a melding of the true traditions, the dragon tradition and the woman tradition. But that was the temptive serpent art phenomenon of like the 13th century. This is specifically a unique depiction in that it's just the face is the female. It doesn't have naked breasts. It doesn't have a naked female torso, which a lot is the depiction that conflate femininity with the serpent. A lot of them do. You'll find all sorts. You'll find just with the woman's head and a whole snake body or with the torso with or without breasts. There, there is a lot of experimentation. Please. Right, so there is the sexual element, which of course is very strong in Christian uh, interpretation. Uh, in Jewish, a little bit different. There's not this concept of the original sin. However, there, there are midrashim about a, a sexual component between Eve and the serpent. Uh, as far as the belly, in, at that time it may very well have been considered a, a kind of beauty. Uh, also, there are some art historians who believe that this were, was perhaps an indication that she was, at a future time, going to give birth. So, not necessarily she's pregnant at the moment. <coughs> Let me just take two or three more questions, because we need to move along, please. Well, I can't see the details from where I'm sitting with my eyes, but I get the sense that they look beautiful and healthy. Yeah. 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 So, nakedness as health, well, right, positive. along with the naturist movement. Well, Positive, nothing shameful. Yeah, someone over here. Uh, actually, I was almost about to say the same thing, and I also don't see anything besides the, the, <laughs> the outcome. But I think um, they are really the part of nature. So they are at the stage when it is really, to pick up from the word natural, they are in the natural state. It's not any offense or it's not any. Nature and natural, nothing, nothing to hide, no shamefulness connotations. They uh, moving ahead a couple of centuries, Gustav Klimt, a, an Austrian artist, uh, how do you see, this is, you can barely see Adam, his head is just peering above Eve here, and here she is, not covered at all. What is this Eve like in terms of her nakedness, nudeness, nudity, unclothed, what's that? More erotic, what makes you say that? Okay. Open, relaxed. Uh, notice she's also out front, literally out front. She's covering Adam. Uh, 
I like to show this because it's fairly rare. I've actually never seen a piece before in which Eve and Adam are, are together, but she's obscuring him. They're usually together or apart, but you can see both their bodies. Emphasize, right. So to what extent is uh, nakedness associated with, uh, with seductiveness? Yeah. And what do you draw from that? Um, what do you think? I draw from that? What do you say? <laughs> Seductress. Mm -hmm. the initiator. The initiator. Uh, and notice the, so in yeah. some sense, does nakedness uh, possibly give a woman power through the power of seduction? Please. <coughs> I actually think this feels very different from the last one. Um, she feels, this feels more private, more intimate, much less exhibitionist, as if you've stumbled upon a, a bedroom or a, something private, whereas the other one felt like, look at me, this feels less confident. Or Even though she's completely uncovered here, interesting that it seems to you more, more somehow more covered. Not or is covered not the right word? Not covered, um, but more private. The other, the other stance felt more prominent, more, more in your face, not in your face in an aggressive way, but more private, out there. Right, so what would, right, so something to consider is the difference between being naked in a more private or closed in space and in a more open public space. Bathsheba, Rembrandt, Bathsheba at her bath. Not clear whether this was when David saw her or when she was getting ready to be taken by him when his messengers came to, or possibly what artists can often do is not take a particular snapshot of a moment, but conflate a couple of things, a couple of episodes into one thing. Uh, this is possible. They they're pretty sure that it's modeled uh, on, on Rembrandt's mistress. Uh, and over here you have an older woman, uh, as uh, I, I call this, uh, help her as pedicurist. <laughs> she is helping with Bathsheba. How, how do you see Bathsheba here? Talk to me in terms of her, st not stance, because she's sitting down, but her gestures, her posture, her body, her expression, her face. What's just What strikes you right away? She's yeah. Sure. She's not displaying herself. She's more doing something bodily, but not necessarily sexual. She's unsure of herself. Her body of posture shows that she's unsure of herself. What, what about her body makes you say that? Yeah. The po her pose, the way she's sitting, and the way her head um, is turned. Again, uh -huh. I don't see the details from here, but I think that she, here's a woman that is not going to conquer this man. She, he is a woman that, at this moment, is not feeling too comfortable. Mm -hmm. Her head is turned a little bit down. Does the crossing of her leg, did that influence you in saying what you said? Possibly as well. So okay. She's kind of closing off. Uh-huh. Okay. So to what extent can make it also be a little bit closed? Yeah. I don't know if I have the advantage of seeing the details here, but I have to the opposite. Yeah. She's so Modest, yeah. And w what are the circumstances under which modest and naked can go together? You know, think, it depends if someone's watching, or what if someone's watching in a different way? I'm having a picture in my mind of the mikvah lady with, with women in the mikvah. They're, they're watching, but they're not watching. Yeah. There's a bunch of clothing over here. So she's choosing to be in the place. I mean, I also agree. She looks like she's in powerful. She's in control. She's very confident. She's very sure of herself. And it doesn't look sexualized at all. Yeah, because we're seeing Eve before there was clothing. Right. She didn't even have that option at the moment. Right. Yeah, let me just take one more. I think we have here for me. There, there, there is that. 
there is that idea that, that you know, the more pious Midrashim say that she was going to the mikvah, and that brings it, you know, is there something in Judaism because of this, with mikvah you need to be naked, when is naked associated with piety? And in many cases they do, the most common depiction of her is at her bath or toilet, depending on it. She's very frequently depicted as, na as, as naked, so it depends when, because Eve was you know, naked for a while, but other people presumably were clothed starting from a, a young age and then were not clothed. Speaking of which, Esther, uh, this is part of the Orientalist tradition of, of French painting, the idea of Middle Eastern women being seductive, uh, seductive and exotic. I, I like to show this because Esther is not usually shown as being naked or without clothes. A couple of very quick reactions, if we could, just two or three. What's the first thing that comes to your mind about her? Is this the Esther you know and love? <laughs> Is this the Esther you could come to love? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. There's a radiance to her that's brought out even more by the fact that there are dark-skinned people in the background, and then also the way that the artist applied his technique makes her... So showing. When can nakedness be, be literally outstanding? Uh, I think you had a question right here. Oh, I thought that she was like the first courtesan <laughs> that you see very naked, which is fine. Mm -hmm. and, and notice that she's not completely naked, just from torso up, we can't see her legs. And so to what extent does the degree, if there is some clothing, uh, think about the difference between clothing on different parts of the, if, if someone is partially clothed, which part is clothed and which not. Uh, thank you. Just a couple of sprinklings here of, uh, of different images, and uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, so I asked Louis to, to do this so that we can sort of start thinking in general about the variety of ways that the naked body, and I actually have to say I am not an art historian, so the distinction between the, I don't know who said the naked nude. <coughs> Okay, so you can help me figure that out. I actually was thinking as you said that, that basically I think I'm talking about the unclothed body. That's what I think I'm doing because we're going to be talking about stripping, essentially, and, and the activity of stripping in the Bible. But the distinction between nude and naked is sort of beyond me, so it would be interesting to, to learn more about that. But in just thinking through the session and thinking about the variety of ways that the unclothed or the naked body can be seen. I came up with my own list in general, which you know I think just came through also in Lewis's presentation. So the naked body can be seen as being erotic, right? Something that is erotic. The naked body can also be seen as something that is beautiful. The naked body can be seen as something that is powerful. The naked body can be seen as something that is innocent, a symbol of innocence. Um, and the naked body, the other, the other way I think of looking at the naked body, I think is something that is, I don't know, necessarily shameful, but something that is connected to shame in some ways. If you can think of other ways that the naked body can be seen or is seen, that would be helpful. I have two mics. Oh, I don't need this? Oh, excellent. All right. Even better. All right. I'm sorry. So if you can come up with other ways. Yes. We have it. I'm thinking vulnerable. Actually, that's perfect. So, in, so vulnerable is actually should be definitely on the list of, of how we see the naked body. Yes. Well, thinking about incubi and succubi and Lilith, it, I mean, it's also a threat. Okay. So the naked body can be a threat, and one of the things to think about actually as we go through some of the gender material is one kind of naked body more threatening, more vulnerable, more powerful, more erotic, right, than another naked body. So now I want us to focus really on the naked body in the context of the Bible, in the context of the Torah. And before I get started in terms of 
what I think is going on here. I'm curious if you know if you were to say how the naked body was perceived in the context of Torah, would you think it is perceived positively or negatively? What do you think? How do you think the Torah deals with the naked body? Neutrally? <laughs> Does the Torah like a naked body? Is the naked body seen as something as being <coughs> beautiful or powerful? Yeah. But you have the story of Noah and his sons yeah, right. coming yeah, in. Right. And yeah. having to cover up the body. Actually, that's a story that I didn't think to bring in, but that's, that's an excellent story to, to, to raise. Yeah, Claire? Just uh, in, the, in the Eve thing, it's our room is the yes. So actually, we're going to talk about that. We're going to begin by looking at Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, and see how nakedness is perceived in that particular story. But I think generally, typically, just to push us through, you, you basically think that the naked body in the context of Torah, negative, right? You don't want to view it. And in fact, the two texts that I want to bring up, I think will will bring that across, right? That the naked body is actually not seen as something that is beautiful, Right or erotic in a positive sense, though we have to sort of look at that, um, and that most of you know when historians or art historians think about this, for the most part they think that the naked body becomes beautiful really within the Greeks and the Romans, and that in the context of the Torah the naked body is not perceived that way. Basically, what I have come to do in thinking through this material and what we're going to look at now is I think that's probably a perception that's correct that the naked body is not seen as being positive. Right in the context of the Torah, that doesn't mean that it's not seen as being powerful, right? And that's something that I want us to unpack a little bit, okay? As we look through, yeah. One question, we'll start. I, I, I see we're going to talk about Adam and Eve. I mean, we're, if, if the human body is made in the image of uh, God, then the human body is at least beautiful to God. So we're gonna. So let's. So let's start there, to some extent. Let's look at Adam and Eve. So obviously, yeah. Um, when you're saying Torah, you mean Torah Dach or Tanakh? Tanakh. Okay. Right? In fact, part of what we're going to look at is the Nach part and not right. the Torah. So let's actually begin with that. Because the, the nakedness, obviously, as we just saw a moment ago, but is certainly part of the story of Adam and Eve. So I want to look at very briefly at a couple of selections from that story to see how nakedness is perceived. So the first thing, and you have this on your list, actually the, the first time that we mention the naked body is right after the creation of the female. And it's at the end of the first page in verse 23, in chapter 2, verse 23. It says, then the man said, this is Adam, said as he looked at the female, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for from man was she taken. Hence a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife so that they become one flesh. The two of them were naked. The man and his wife. Velo yit boshashu, and they were not shamed. Okay? So this actually is really quite interesting. So if you only had this, right, as sort of your understanding of how nakedness is perceived in the Bible, what would you say? Is this positive or negative? One would seem it would be a positive. Anything else? Yeah, Vanessa? Well, it implies that they should have felt shame but did not feel shame. It's like bringing an assumption into the text by raising it. Okay, so that's actually quite interesting because obviously I think one of our more typical associations with nakedness has to do with shame. So at this point, you know, they're not, the specter of shame is there, but they're not quite shamed yet, which I would say then means that nakedness in this context, the term that I would use, would be that it symbolizes a kind of innocence, right? A sort of innocence or purity at this particular point. Yeah. Actually, what's great about that is, in fact, it's not, right? But what you have here, for those of you who are JTS students, right, you have what's called a disjunctive sentence, which means that you usually, in, in Hebrew, the engine of a sentence is the verb. When you don't have that verb going for, you know, as the first part of the sentence, that breaks the sentence up and it adds a certain element of a, you know, the but or the yet, the contrary nature. So here I actually think that it's fair to read it as a kind of but. So there you have, Vanessa, you sort of what you were just saying, a kind of, you know, contrast between 
that they're not yet shamed, right? There's a sort of contrast that's assumed there. Any, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to go to the other text as well, but the real question, is there any eroticism at this point in the naked body? No. No, no one sees it. No. Well, I'll tell you. I think that honestly, I mean, <coughs> this might be overreading it, but what does it just follow? So in fact... But that seems to be an innocent, natural... Thing. Yes. But what I want to suggest, and I, you know, this again may be for those of you who know me, I, I am the first to admit that I overread, so I may be overreading here. But to me, the juxtaposition of these two verses to say that it actually comes after the sense of the man cleaving to his wife, and they become one flesh, which in fact can be, one assumes a sort of sexual, you know, that's what they're describing here. And then we have the fact that the two of them are naked, but not shamed. So I wonder if the juxtaposition of the two of them, I'm not saying that it's meant to be the eroticized naked body here, but there is a context of sexuality, all right? Let's move on a little bit, because obviously the story gets much more complicated as we go on. And we know that the, the great uh, sin happens, and, and Eve hands a fruit to Adam, and they eat, and they defy God's commandment. And the first thing they do is, and this is in verse 7, after they've done this, their eyes, both of them, were opened. They perceived that they were naked, and they sewed together fig leaves and made themselves loincloths. This is in verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God moving about in the garden at the breezy time of the day. And the man and his wife hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he replied, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree from which I had forbidden you to eat? And then we have the, the blame game that happens after this. All right. So obviously when I'm interested in nakedness here. So has the perception of what it means to be naked shifted in this particular text? And in what ways has it? So, so it's become shameful. It is every socially constructed. So, what does that mean? It means that it's relative, depending on the environment that you're in. What is naked? You need to be told it. It has to do with the viewer. So, the fact that somebody actually—that's really quite interesting. And we raised that a little bit about the sense that you have to be seen. Like the sense of feeling naked and that someone is seeing you. And that could actually be actually a beautiful distinction between what was before. The sense that this, actually I never thought about that. But this is the sense where God is now as the third party coming into the picture. So he's the seer, right? And so when you are being seen, suddenly your consciousness of nakedness. Now, does everyone agree shame? Um, One, let me get other people too. Well, I I think there's a, a, I look at it slightly differently, that they were almost like the other animals in Gan Eden, you know, un, completely unselfconscious. And part of what happened in, you know, knowing the people in the land is, is now they're human, and they're taking on that sense that you don't go around naked. Um, well, that's the, right. Human beings don't go around naked. And, uh, you know, they were, they hid, and... You know, because they were naked and they, and they, they don't want God to see them, whereas before that wasn't an issue for them. Okay, and I, you know, I actually, you know, the, the sense that the human being is in that state is sort of distinguished, but that actually moves away from the, the shamefulness. I mean, then, it, you know, the distinction is not necessarily one based on shame. I think I see that whole bit a little bit differently, is that nakedness is something that God perceives. It was sort of like bizarre knowledge, and now the human was able to perceive it too. So it was like, because at the beginning, in the first line, doesn't say that, hi, I'm naked, it's in the third person. The two of them were naked. They weren't yet able to perceive their nakedness. It's only when they gained knowledge from the ape that they would be able to perceive nakedness. That's sort of like a higher level. Of consciousness. consciousness right. Okay. And that, again, you know, maybe has, saves it and gives it more of a positive, you know, connotation. The, the piece here that I, I think is sort of interesting is the fact that they say, you know, the, the fact that they feel afraid, right? So, were you going to say something about that? He's afraid because he knows he's done something wrong. He's not afraid because he's naked. He's done something wrong. He's afraid not to eat. Yeah, he's afraid because then he's naked. So, what does the nakedness do with the? If you combine the nakedness and the fear, what would be the feeling then that you think that this individual is feeling? Well, I only see it as 
that's what I would say. There's a challenge here. There's the human challenge to God being the other who's seeing this. Right. So there's the question of later on piety and all that that brings up. Right. And we're gonna and actually that's a good segue into the next text, but I wanna and I wanna get there. So let me just say this and then we'll move on because the more information that we have, the better we are. But to me, this combination of the fear and the consciousness. To me, in this context, I would say that nakedness is not necessarily yet associated with shame. I think it's associated with vulnerability, right? And at this point in the narrative, I think the nakedness is the sense of vulnerability. They feel literally what Lewis said about feeling exposed. And that exposure makes them feel afraid and I think vulnerable to what can happen. Right? I don't think at this point we have an integral, there's no shame yet involved in it. I think it's more vulnerability than it is anything else. The last piece of the story is the piece de resistance that I think is really important to look at. So if you just go to the end of chapter 3 on the next page, it says, the man, knew, uh, the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living, and the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them, okay? But so, their own clothing wasn't good enough because when they appeared to God, they were already sewn together with fig leaves and had loincloths. Okay. No, I think we're not, and so I think there's a certain sense where, and again, you know, we don't entirely know, and obviously for those of you who are the Midrashists in the room, you know that in sense, what does it mean to be clothed in skin? Skin, right, is that literally God is somehow these creatures at this point become embodied, right, in their actual physical skin as if they were not prior to that. So it could be, you know, a poetic use of that in some ways. But I think more to the point is that when you are clothing and, you know, in skins, I think there's more of an, an element of sophistication and civilization, right? That before, exactly what Lewis said, there was this sort of naked body in the natural environment that somehow now becomes more civilized, right? But for my, what is interesting to me is, of course, who provides the clothing? God, right? And this, ladies and gentlemen, to me, as far as I'm concerned, is the paradigm that we're going to now see play out. Because this question of, aren't you beautiful before God? And isn't the nakedness sort of, you know, in some ways that you represent the creation of God, what is fascinating to me about the Bible is, in fact, it's, the op it's not the opposite, but it's a different emphasis. So it's not the beauty of the body as being in the image of God that is, in fact, what we're going to focus upon. It's not. It's the fact that God will provide the clothing. And the clothing becomes symbolic of or representative of God's care for you as an individual. So to me, and this is the, one of the themes that, I, that I'm thinking through as I go through this material, this is really, to me, the essence in some ways of the, you know, what it means to have the naked body. I would say we're going to see that shame definitely comes into the picture, but I think the real issue here is vulnerability, that the naked body is in the state of vulnerability, and that the clothed body, and this gets to your point, right? It's the clothed body that shows God's care and protection. So you don't want to remove those clothing, that clothing, because if you remove that clothing, you're no longer protected by God, okay? The second, I want to push through the material a little bit, and then you can ask your questions. The second, the second you can have a private you know, audience with me. Um, <laughs> The second text that I just wanted, I, I wanted to br bring in as a kind of general text about how the naked body is perceived, this is another probably somewhat familiar. This comes from the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus, and this comes right after the revelation at Sinai. You have immediately after that the Ten Commandments. You have the, uh, these laws about how to create an altar for God. And at the end of this, this is the beginning, this is the top of page 4 that you have in your packets, starting at verse 21. It says, Make for me an altar of earth, and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your sacrifices of well-being, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. And if you make for me an altar of stones, do not build it of hewn, sto hewn stones, for by wielding your tool upon them, you have profaned them. Okay. Do not ascend my altar by steps, that your nakedness may not be exposed upon it. Okay? 
So, in other words, if you had to rephrase this, you don't worship God without clothing. Okay? So, what's this about? Does this change the perception of the naked body? Does it enter, does that recontextualize it? Vanessa? Well, I mean, if he's addressing that as an issue, you have to assume that people were somehow worshiping God okay. naked. So this is very good, right, to say this. So one way, I mean, first of all, why this is the case, right? You get a law like this, and if you're a Bible scholar, you ask yourself, well, where does this come from? What is the background? And so what Vanessa just said is it's almost like it, it reads like a polemic. Right? That this is precisely, we do not do this because everybody else does. And actually, what we know from the ancient world that the Bible comes from, the ancient Near East, is that actually is true. And so that we have elsewhere in the ancient world, there wasn't a taboo, you could worship God in the nude. Right? Not to be more careful my terminology, but naked, right? <laughs> Unclothed. That was something that you could do. And so Israel, one of its defining characteristics in terms of ritual and worship is that we no longer do that, right? But then again, it raises this question about why. And it's precisely this text that most scholars sort of pin their sense of the naked body as seen as being negative in the context of Judaism because of this text, right? You don't expose your body to God. That would be inappropriate behavior, all right? Somehow that's just wrong. And we don't, you know, I, I really can't offer you a good reason why that is the case. I know that we don't really know. But one thing that is basically suggested about this text, and I think does carry out to some of the other texts, it's a question of social hierarchy in this context. So that you don't, that somehow God is clearly hierarchically a higher being than you are. And it would be bad form in some ways to expose yourself before God. And so that the nakedness in this context is seen as being, you know, it would be disrespectful, not shameful, right? That's what I'm, you know, I want to be clear. At this point, it's still not shameful. We still do not have shame entering into the picture. Does everyone see that? Shame is really not part of it yet. We're going to get shame now, <laughs> but at this point, it's really not there. So I would say so far, we have vulnerability and we have a certain kind of respect proper behavior, but not shame. You want to say something? I, I, didn't, I didn't understand why it would be by the steps that you're making this. Yes, they're not wearing underwear. Yes, they're not wearing underwear. Like yes. kind of they're, they're not wearing underwear. And in fact, so this is actually a good question, they're not wearing underwear. So the text that I want to bring in now about the sort of, I want to move now into the gender piece and think about the naked female body and the naked male body. And you can probably already guess, you know, you meet more naked female bodies in the Bible than you do naked male bodies. But one of the pieces that you get, as you'll see now, is that the men, it really is a question of the loincloth and removing the loincloth. And in particular, right, one of the things that actually distinguishes priests, you know, people that could do the ritual and the worship, is that they wore loincloths. And so actually... One of the interpretations of this particular text is to say that it's actually not about general nakedness, but rather about making sure that the, the Jewish professionals were the one doing the worship. So that a typical person would not be wearing underwear, but a priest would be. So one of the ways to look at this is to say that, that that's why looking at the loincloth. All right? So the next text that you have in your packet actually relates to that, which is a little, we're not going to deal with it, but you can have it in your spare time. You can go back and look at it, which is a wonderful story about King David who exposes himself, right? It's a good story to read in the context of what we just did. And poor, you know, Michal gives him a little criticism about that, which he doesn't like. But that's a nice story to look at because, again, it, it sort of looks at nakedness as being, again, a sort of disrespectful gesture. You don't do that when you're worshiping God. But I want to move now into looking and thinking about the difference between the naked female body and the naked male body. And is there a difference in the context of the Bible in terms of how they are perceived? I actually think there is. And I'm going to share with you that with you a little bit. Um, as I said, I'm sort of in the early stages of thinking about this, so I welcome your, your reactions and your responses. But I'm going to make the case that there is a distinction between how the female body is perceived naked and how the male body is perceived. Okay? That is, I'm going to make that distinction. 
as I said just a moment ago, that you have many more examples of the exposed female body, as we're going to see now in the prophetic material particularly, than you do of the male. And I think that speaks a lot, right? The fact that you have more examples of the naked female body, I think gives you a sense of the potency, right? And I mean in terms of potency of how you respond to it, not the potency of the, ob of the naked body itself, right? But the sense that it appears quite a lot. And I actually had to really look for naked male bodies. I found them, but I had to really look for them, right? So the fact that you meet a lot more naked female bodies tells you something about the potency of that image. So the first text that I read, that was actually one of the texts that was mentioned in the, the, head pa uh, the panel on the head covering this morning, comes from the prophet Hosea. This is a, one of our most disturbing texts, so I share, I, I told you I'd be subversive, so this is where I'm going to be a little subversive. Um, this is a text that comes from the prophet Hosea, who has made an unfortunate marriage himself uh, to a promiscuous woman, uh, is comparing all of Israel to his own promiscuous wife, and saying that Israel, right, has behaved as promiscuously as his own wife, and now has to be treated as a woman that has committed adultery. And what we're reading now is the reaction, the response that you should have with a woman who has committed adultery, right? This is his response. So he's really talking about all of Israel. I'm going to read this, and as I'm reading it, what I want you to think about again is, so what does this say about nakedness and how it is perceived? All right, we got that? Excellent. So here's the, the passages. I've I have, some of you have them bracketed out. This is on page 7 of your packet. This is verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. And let her put away her harlotry from her face, and her adultery from between her breasts. Else will I strip her naked, and leave her as on the day she was born. And I will make her like a wilderness, Render her like a desert land and let her die of thirst. I will also disown her children, for they are now a harlot's brood, in that their mother has played the harlot. She has conceived them, has acted shamelessly, because she thought, I will go after my lovers who supply my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Turn the page. Go down to 11. Assuredly, I will take back my new grain in its time, and my new wine in its season, and I will snatch away my wool and my linen that serve to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her shame. Let me just tell you, the Hebrew, this is a little bit more, uh, it's actually the word here is navluta, which does mean shame, but it actually most likely also we have a, a cognate in Akkadian that, that makes us actually, this is vagina, so this is actually a very pointed, so I'm going to uncover her. Um, in the very sight of her lovers, and none shall save her from me. Skip down to verse 13, uh, 15, I'm sorry. Thus will I punish her for the days of Baalim, on which she brought them offerings, when decked with earrings and jewels, she would go after her lovers, forgetting me, declares the Lord. Responses. So how is naked, has, do you see a difference now in how nakedness was perceived from the text we just did to how they started being defined now? What has happened? It's equated with idolatry. So Nick, actually that's nice relative to what I just said about the Shmo passage and the sense that the other people worship, right, in a kind of, so that makes some sense. So that nakedness is sort of equated with idolatry. Any other responses? Other? And therefore, no God's protection. Okay. What were you going to say? The loss of God's favor. So the loss of God's favor. Any other responses just to this text? We also have just introduced the word that we haven't seen before. Shame, right? Shame to some extent, right? Shame to some extent. The question that I have, I mean, you know, there's no doubt, I would say, there's no doubt that exposing the female body is... Part is, is an active act of shaming her, right? But there's a difference between saying that exposing the female body is about shaming someone than saying that the naked female body itself is shameful. 
So there is, I, I want to make that distinction. There's no doubt about it that by removing the clothes, because what else is she supposed to be done? It's all before she's, the, she's stripped before before her lovers. There's going to be witnesses. So you're exposing her publicly, which is interesting in terms of thinking through. So it's important that she is being seen. Yes? So if you want to shame a person, and that person is a male person, then that person probably has property, a home, and all this sort of thing. A woman at this time, I don't know, you tell me, wouldn't have had, she had like no possessions, basically. Okay. So to take off her clothing was almost the only way to achieve shaming her. Yeah. So let me let me I'm twist saying, it. I don't think that that necessarily means that a woman's body is more shameful than a man's body. Right. So let me twist it a little bit because I totally, I actually really agree. And the, the second passage after the Hosea passage that I included actually comes from Isaiah where you are literally commanded to strip the women of all their beautiful head, their headgear, a la Carol earlier, and their jewelry, and you remove all these things, right? And that's precisely the possessions that the women have. But I want to kind of invert what you just said a little bit because you're right. This is how you shame the women. But how do you really shame a man? In this culture, by shame in the woman. So, in some ways, I mean, you know, to get into the mindset of this mentality, you have to really twist and turn your head around a lot because, in fact, you have to understand that this is addressed to a male elite audience and that you're basically caught, who has just been called, essentially, that's Israel. So, you've just basically called Israel a promiscuous woman that needs to be stripped. So you are, you know, who you're shaming in this passage is really quite interesting, right? Um, Dahlia. I don't know what I want to do this, but I'm particularly struck by the comparison of the nakedness to the desert. Yes. As opposed to usually, I think it's just that, particularly in art, when we think of nakedness and the voluptuous and sort of the so, what, it's required, what it offers, what it's here, the nakedness is very banned. So part of what this metaphor is about really is about the land. So Israel, the good bride, is lush and fertile and like the land. Israel, the shameful, shamed woman, is going to become like the desert. You know, there's going to be a certain sort of removing of. But what I actually think is interesting about this is there's a certain sense, I mean, the desert has a kind of dual image in some ways. I mean, on the one hand, it's also where Israel came alive, right? So in this sense, there's a certain, I mean, this is a very negative image, and you are going to be reduced back to a barren land, right, where you do not have God's protection and where you no longer have any actually real connection to God. So I think that desert Im Im imagery is very significant here. And I would say, I mean, I want to move on to the, the final passage and look a little bit at the male naked body. But again, I want to say that there is the element of shaming, right, that the woman is clearly going to be shamed. But in my reading of this, the naked body is really, I would say, more about the vulnerability, particularly in the desert imagery. And essentially, by removing the clothing, you're almost going back to that bray sheet paradigm, the Genesis paradigm, of the sense that God provides the clothing. Right? And in fact, in Hosea, she is the, you know, she thought that all the wool and the linen and the jewelry that she had gotten, which came from her lovers, that was sort of, she thought that she was adorned by these lovers as opposed to really knowing the truth because who really adorns her? God. So what you need to do is remove the finery, you remove God's protection, and you make her like the day she was born, which is not a period of innocence, right? But rather a period where you are most vulnerable and you lack God's protection. Now, I want to switch gears and the end point just so then we can respond and put it all together. Because there are two examples that I found of the naked male body. And I think there are striking differences between how the naked male body is presented. So the first one is probably in some ways the most familiar to you all, which is, is the last text I included. So let's go to the last text. This comes from the prophet Isaiah. And the two, so I'm going to give you an example from the prophet Isaiah and then a prophet, the prophet Jeremiah. So this is the, should be the last page of your packet, page 17. Verse 2, 20 verse 2. Previously, the Lord had spoken to Isaiah, son of Amoz, saying, Go, 
untie the sackcloth from your loins, back to our you know, covering of the, of the loins, and take your sandals off your feet, which he had done, going naked and barefoot. And now the Lord said, it is a sign and important for Egypt and Nubia, just as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot for three years. So shall the king of Assyria drive off the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Nubia, young and old, naked and barefoot, with bared buttocks, it does say that, to the shame of Egypt. And they shall be dismayed and chagrined because of Nubia their hope and Egypt their boast. In that day, the dwellers of this coastland shall say, if this could happen to those who we look to, to whom we fled for help and rescue from the king of Assyria, how can we ourselves escape? So let me just rephrase this a second. So Isaiah the prophet goes around naked and barefoot for three years to convey the message to Egypt that they too will be sent, Egypt, right, be sent into captivity naked and barefoot, okay? So to me, I just want to say this, this reads very differently in my mind than what we just read, right? So here, the nakedness of the prophet I would say, is a sign, right? Needs to be read and interpreted is part of his message. So people will see that he is naked and barefoot and they will be, and they will get the message that they too will become naked and barefoot. Is the prophet shamed? Not at all, right? So his nakedness is part of his prophecy. It's a sign to be read, okay? I want to, and then we can open up to questions. Just look at the last example. There's another example, which is uh, several pages back from the book of Jeremiah. This is chapter 13. Right? So this is on page 10. Everyone there? Okay. Thus the Lord said to me, Go buy yourself a loincloth of linen and put it around your loins. But don't dip it into water. So I bought the loincloth in accordance with the Lord's command, and I put it about my loins. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the loincloth which you bought, which is about your loins, and go at once to Prat and cover it up there in a cleft of a rock. I went and I buried it at Prat as the Lord had commanded me. Then, after a long time, the Lord said to me, Go at once to Prat and take there the loincloth, which I commanded you to bury there. So I went to Prat and I dug up the loincloth from the place where I had buried it and found the loincloth ruined. It was not good for anything. The word of the Lord came to me. Thus said the Lord, Even so will I ruin the overweening pride of Judah and Jerusalem. This wicked people who refuse to heed my bidding, bidding who follow the willfulness of their own hearts, who follow other words and serve them and worship them, shall become like that loincloth, which is not good for anything. For as a loincloth clings close to the loins of the man, so I brought close to me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, declares the Lord, that they might be my people for fame and praise and splendor, but they would not obey. Okay, so let's unpack this just a little bit. So Jeremiah the prophet is told to wear a loincloth, right? He's told then to take the loincloth off and bury it. Now this, I have to say, is not necessarily, I mean, I may be stretching it a little bit to say this is a naked male body, but I do think, I mean, he is asked to remove clothing, right? He is asked to strip his clothing. He is asked to bury his clothing, right? Remove it from his loins. He goes back and he looks and the loincloth is in fact rotten. And God says that just as this loincloth rots, you know, the loincloth was Israel that I had, that had cleaved to, the, to me, now Israel is rotten, right? And obviously it's, it's doomed to have, you know, a similar, to, to have a fate like that. So to me, this is, again, a very different example of, or a very different way that the naked body is, is perceived, right? So here again, we have a prophet that is essentially supposed to expose his body. But again, by exposing his body, is he shamed? No. no. In fact, again, the exposing of the prophet's body, of the male body, is a sign to be read and interpreted, right? And actually, to me, what's actually quite interesting about this is in some ways it inverts, because who's, so look at it this way. What? 
So here we go. I mean, if you think about from how to bring this completely, in, in some ways, into a circle, we began by saying that God is the one that provides the clothing, right? That God is the one that is going to be providing the clothing. And so the naked body is itself the exposed and vulnerable body. There's something, I think, really quite interesting about this end image because you're essentially, you're removing the clothing from whom? from God's body, right? You're exposing God's body. But that is not a sense of God's vulnerability or his shamefulness. In fact, it's been inverted so that the clothing themselves, the rotten loincloth, becomes the thing that is sort of symbolic, right? The thing that is the shameful thing, the thing that is, is no longer valued. And to me, so I, just to, to pull this together, I think that the naked male body, from these two examples, right, we have two prophets that in some ways expose their bodies, that the naked male body becomes a kind of divine sign, something that is red. It's not about shaming the prophet. And in fact, the body of the prophet, the exposed prophet, is somewhat representative of God's own body. Right? So by exposing the prophet's body, you're reading it like a sign. And the, it's almost like, you know, the prophet, the naked prophet is in some ways representative of God. I mean, that's what we have with Jeremiah at the end, which is very different than the exposing of the female body. Right? It feels very different. So I'm going to stop here and let there, because I know we're running, we have some timing issues. If there are any comments or responses, yes. Yeah, I thought about male exposed body. I mean, I, 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 I hear you and I, I agree you know, that, that the prophets don't get any shame, but I feel like the, the way the symbols are read is that they're symbols of shame themselves. Right? And maybe the shame isn't directly at the prophet, but, but in the example in, in Ezekiel, right, that, that it's not that Ezekiel's going to be shamed, it's that these other people are going to be shamed. Uh, and, that, and that, I don't know if you read the shame of the Egyptians back onto Ezekiel or not. And the same thing here, you know, to be a full, right, that God <coughs> may be somehow is shamed by picking Israel as the loincloth and having the loincloth fail God, so to speaking, leaving him. Well, I actually, I mean, that's a, I actually would go in that direction that to some extent the corruption of Israel is to God's own shame. So just as we said a moment ago, right, about the sort of, you know, who's really being shamed here. To shame a male, you, sh you know, you have to shame his woman in this culture. So to some extent, I mean, you know, you have to add in God's own shaming in all of this, and you're absolutely correct. But my point is basically that the, you still have the exposed male, I mean, there is an element where it's used to shame others, but the exposed male body itself is not shameful, right? It is simply an instrument through which you get the other message across. Whereas the female body, Functions, I think, very differently. Yeah. That's what I would, would say. Yeah. Is the, is the word a Roman a room not? Are they not related? It's not so this is a very interesting question. So there, in you know, so a room is actually nakedness. A room is cunning, yeah. right? And in fact, they are distinct words. But you know, clearly with the Brachy passage, it's it's a it's a play on the words, right? And pulling it together. Then there is a suggestion that there is some negative attribute in the nakedness. And that is cunning. Well, that is associated with a kind of cunningness. Yeah, I mean, I, and it, basically, I would say that in the context of the Bible, back to one of my initial questions, the answer to the question of is you know nakedness perceived as a negative, I would say yes. You know, I don't think we are sort of celebrating the naked body at all. The only thing that we have closest to celebrating, excuse me, the naked body is what? Or a body. Would be Shira Shireen. But in that context, you know, I would say it's, but it's isolated body parts that often get to be, you know, that are compared to other things. So it's the naked body once, twice removed. So I would say the Noah story, which I haven't really, you know, integrated into my thinking in this particular, you know, thinking about in this talk context. But I would say that uh, I actually would say that if I go back to, you know, thinking through that nakedness, the problem with nakedness or seeing nakedness, and maybe it is more seeing male nakedness, is the sense that you are disrespectful. So the thing with Noah and his sons. 
right, is the question of can a son see his father naked? And seeing it as a, a gesture of disrespect, as opposed, you know, again, that puts it sort of within the context of what we're talking about. Yeah. Just one thought, um, it's not so much the human body, but about the whole clothing thing. It's about God clothing himself or the veiling image within within total, which gives us that sense, again, we kind of stuck in the divine right now, but it gives us that sense of somehow the hiding of it is um, protective in a way, just like clothing is for humans, that Moshe can't see God directly. And, and well, and I think that's the again the element of vulnerability and exposure. And of course, I mean, I think there's something there to be said about you know seeing you know we think about seeing God's face and getting too close and feeling like there's a danger in that kind of intimacy and proximity. So I think there's you know there's something there. I wanted to say something about the eroticism for a second because. You know, so here's the thing that I didn't say about the, the female naked body, is that obviously in some ways if you are exposing the body and exposing it to make her vulnerable and to shame her, I think before her lovers, there's, there's a certain kind of basic sense that it is an erotic, eroticized body, right? There is something about that that at least acknowledges the fact that the naked female body is erotic, right? Because she to do it... She's had lovers. I mean, she's sort of defined by her body. And in some ways, actually, in the Ezekiel passage, it says that she has become, you know, she's, uh, you have it all in your packet, so you can look at it, that she's, you know, she's sort of grown too fond of herself. She's begun to trust herself too much in her own beauty. So there's some, you know, even though th there's some kind of, I think, implicit sense that her body is potent and, and erotic in a way. Taiba, and then we have to I'd go to the next session. I, I'm just wondering, the fact that you chose prophets to exemplify the male nakedness, is that not an issue because the prophets had a certain role in society? Were there other men you could have chosen to look at? Well, I, you wouldn't consider Eve a prophet. No, no. And, you know, the truth is that... You know, it's an interesting, there aren't that, but there aren't that many choices that I could have, you know, selected. It really is in, you know, it's really the prophets, frankly, that you get most of this imagery in general. There's really not that much about the exposed body other, in other places, which is itself interesting. It really comes into the literature in the prophets. So there wasn't much, you know, my choice was sort of made for me in some ways. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop here. I'm happy to have you all. <laughs>